It's Friday night in the A, and you know what that means. Kelly Price and Tori McElhaney coming at you on Rise Up Tonight. Presented by AT&T. Well, the Atlanta Falcons had an opportunity to put some distance between them and the rest of the NFC South. Tori, that did not happen. How are we kind of feeling about week 15 here? It's here. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk a lot about it, but I honestly, I, I'll say this later in the show, but I honestly thought that we would be in a different point at this point in the season in terms of just wins, records, all that. It's here and it's happening and we're talking about it. The Falcons failed yet again to string three wins together and in the process they ended up in a three-way tie for the division lead rather than taking control of the NFC South. So let's get into it and huddle up about it. Let's huddle up with Kelly and Tori on the world of Falcons football. So Sunday was kind of a microcosm of the Ritter coaster we've been on. Desmond Ritter threw for a career high 347 yards, 26 of 40, a touchdown along with an interception. At times, you saw the upside the Falcons like in him along with critical errors we've continued to see. Truly a microcosm of his nine touchdown, nine interception season. So here's where we're at. This offense is 15th in yards per game with 336.7, yet 24th in points per game with just under 20. Just over 50% in the red zone scoring among the bottom half of the league. So where does that leave us and how should we feel about this? I'll be honest, not great. And the stat that you just named that I have the biggest problem with is the 24th in points per game. This offense coming into this year was described as high powered. I don't know about you, but when I think of that term, I think high point totals. But we really don't see that until the fourth quarter. Truly, I looked it up. The Falcons have scored 42% of their total points on the year in the fourth quarter alone. Wow. That's a long time to wait around for points if you're this defense. Let's just be honest, the Falcons need to score more and earlier. Thank you for doing that math because that is a crazy yeah. statistic. So let's look ahead to this Sunday. Wild to think that the last time the Falcons and the Panthers met, hopes were really high on both sidelines. Frank Wright era and Bryce Young era full of promise. Since then, the number one overall pick has, let's say, struggled. Carolina has fired Reich and the Panthers have won just one game. The Falcons have also missed their fair share of opportunities, haven't lived up to their own expectations, and now sit below. 504 games to go but man that week one win for Atlanta just feels like a lifetime ago it really does I think if you would have told me then that this is where both of these teams would be in week 15 of the season I wouldn't have believed you I remember there was so much hope in that week one matchup hope for a better future for both teams but neither team has lived up to the expectations anyone had for them going into the season the only difference is that the Falcons still have a chance in the division Let's call it what it is. This is a game the Atlanta Falcons should win, like by a lot, but you can't just expect a dub in the National Football League. You have to go out and earn it. And as we saw on Sunday, just because the Falcons beat a team once this season doesn't mean they'll do it again. And despite the record and narrative around this Panthers team that we talked about, this is still the league's fourth ranked total defense. Look it up, I swear it's true. <laughs> what have the Falcons been saying about this kind of, the expectations that they have for this game? You know what, I would rather say what I've been saying this week, which is that this Falcons team cannot settle for anything less than a decisive win. What's a decisive win, you ask? It's where the victor leaves no doubt from start to finish that they're winning the game. I don't want a fourth quarter comeback. I don't want a last second field goal. I want this Falcons team to show a dominance that we haven't seen this season from them. Take the lead, extend the lead, and hold the lead. Here at that Santa Claus, that is what we wish for this holiday season. Speaking of expectations, they are always high when I go roll back the pregame tape to see what the fellows were wearing on Sunday. We are walking in, presented by Wells Fargo. You know, Mike Hughes just wants us to know bucket hat season isn't just for summer, but even better than the accessorization, this beautiful utility jacket softened mm. with some embroidered flower details. And while we're at it, let's just add some fringe for pizzazz. Okay, not gonna lie, this kind of feels like two different looks. Up top, <laughs> cool streetwear with the bucket hat. In the middle, a little Western flair. I don't, Ooh, good call. I, I don't think I would have put these two together, but to each their own, and I don't hate this. Next up, Michael Pruitt serving a monochromatic moment. He literally goes beige from his head to his toes. Big fan of the leather bomber jacket yeah. here. Even bigger fan of him finding the exact shade of matching pants. I would wear this, absolutely. Also, I'm so glad it's finally beanie weather because I love this beanie and I, I just love beanies in general. <laughs> <laughs> Comfy vibes for sure. Next up to Marco Hellams in the Jackie Robinson jacket goes hard. Mm. Got cozy vibes, but we also got some color accessorizing yeah. going on with his beanie, again beanie, and kicks, and so pure to see the smile he's wearing the whole time. He looks so happy. So happy. Again, 
love to the beanie, but I also really do love this sweater. This is a great sweater. No notes, DeMarco, absolutely none. <laughs> Finally, linebacker Milo Eifler was elevated from the practice squad this week, and I love the Grinch vibes with the, fu the fuzzy pullover he's got going on, but Milo, what is this purse? <laughs> it is giving suburban mom shopping at Ross. It's giving, can I speak to your manager, Tori? I'm floored. What is going on here? I was not expecting the ultra zoom in. Oh, no, that's so great. There's so many layers to this look. The purple hat adds something. The lime green fluffy sweater adds something. The purse of which I can tell you're shocked about also adds something. I have a lot of questions and no answers here. All right, speaking of questions, the weather outside getting frightful, but staying inside, cuddling up with your favorite holiday movie, oh, so delightful. Tonight, we asked the Falcons what their fave holiday flicks are in our question of the week. Best holiday movie? Ooh, um, ooh I have to go with, uh, man, I'll come back later. Home Alone. Is there, is there any other option? Home Alone. Home Alone and Home Alone too. Home Alone. I like Home Alone. Probably Polo Express. My kids like Polo Express, so I watch it all the time, so I say Polo Express. Friday at the Knicks. What? Yes, it's a holiday movie, but why that, why that one? <laughs> nah, it's just funny. Elf. Elf is one. What is the line? Why? That's just a funny movie. Bye, buddy. Hope you find your dad. There you go. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> See, you're perfect. He's got it. Home Alone 1 and Home 2. Alone. Okay, there you go. I say the original one. Home Alone 1. And I have to go with uh, This Christmas. Okay, you got to pick one, though. Friday at the next. Okay, I gotta agree with the elf pick because yeah. I literally, on our flight back from New York, I watched it with no earphones and I literally laughed the entire time because I knew what all the lines were and they were still funny. Iconic. <laughs> also, I'm kind of upset that there wasn't a lot of love for uh, the live action version of The Grinch. Oh, good, the Grinch call. good call. I, I love that. A lot of Home Alone love too, which Alone. I love to see. Yeah. All right, still to come on Rise Up tonight, we are going in the nest with former Top Chef contestant and award-winning chef Kevin Gillespie. And this guy, as big a Falcon fan as you guys are. Don't miss that later in the show. Plus a pep rally at a local middle school thrown by a Falcon fan favorite and why the real star was not the guy who plays on Sundays. That story is coming up next on Rise Up Tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by the Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. The Home Depot, how do is get more done. Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And truest, when you start with care, you get a different kind of bank. It's time to rise up Atlanta. Kelly and Tori are back on your home for Falcons football. Fox 5 Atlanta. Last Sunday was extra special for Kyle Pitts. He caught his first touchdown as a dad on his newborn son's one month birthday. A few days later, he honored a different group of kids. Luke Hetrick explains as we rise up for Atlanta, brought to you by Truist. Sure, it's empty right now, but give it a few minutes and it's gonna be packed. Why? Ritter taking a shot near side and it's caught! Touchdown, Kyle Pitts! Because this guy's coming. Number eight, center stage, but no, he's not the star. They are. Christmas is the best holiday. So to have my first annual uh, holiday uh, give back, that was pretty awesome. Hey, 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 hey. We got a Kyle Pitts Foundation pep rally to celebrate the students at Jordan Middle School for all their hard work in the classroom and a little bit of good luck before they take their finals. I, I was a little rough around the edges, so it's always, you know, when you work for something, I have a prize behind it. Oh yeah, prizes, photo opportunities with the man himself, cheerleader, Freddie, yeah, all the ingredients of a proper pep rally. Even the pros, though, know the value of a good education. I think it's kind of looked down down upon a little bit. Like, like it's not cool to be smart. Uh, and it's super important. Like, it, it, it allows you to go a lot further than than football will ever take it. So whether it's prep for finals or you're in a dog fight to try and clinch a playoff spot, same advice applies. Keep pushing, keep pushing, it, get, it gets better in the end. In Lawrenceville, Lou Ketrick, rise up tonight. Well, Kyle Pitts touchdown on Sunday, definitely a highlight, but yeah. there were a lot of hard realizations after that loss. First of all, despite technically still having a shot at the division crowd, crown and a spot in the playoffs. The best the Falcons could get is 10 wins on the season, and that's only if they win out. And as you wrote about in your notebook this week, the most recent loss has us all coming to terms with the fact that the Falcons just aren't where we thought they would be right now. Yeah, Kelly, do you remember when we teamed up to talk a little bit about schedule release in May? And 
Back then, I had the team with double-digit wins. Once I saw the team together in training camp, I decided it wasn't crazy to think that with this schedule, which was the easiest strength of schedule in the league this year, that they could win 11 games. What they and that they could sit atop the division and that's not where we are now and there's a chance the Falcons won't get there and that's a hard pill to swallow for a team that had so much potential. Yeah, hard to realize. All right, we will be right back on Rise Up tonight. Welcome back to Rise Up Tonight. Let's head in the nest with Kelly, Tori, and this week's special guest. Brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. We're really excited to have in the nest tonight, Kevin Gillespie, the man behind the Red Beard Restaurant Group, obviously with the Red Beard, Gun Show, former Top Chef. Um, on October 24th, Atlanta became the latest city with a Michelin guide. I think we're all really excited about this. Five Very restaurants received a star um, in the first guide. Gun Show was included as recommended. What does that distinction kind of mean to you? Well, it was really crazy because when I first started in this industry in Atlanta, I never anticipated Michelin to even show up to Atlanta, to be honest with you. <laughs> Um, and so it's it's great. Like when I travel, I use the guide all the time and to have a place of my own listed amongst the best is, is really pretty special for us. When you, you talk about it kind of being a surprise with Atlanta now being in the Michelin Guide, I mean, what, what kind of changes have you seen to get to this point where it is in the Michelin Guide? Well, I think the city has grown up in some ways. Like that, I, that sounds like I'm belittling it, but what I mean is that I remember early on in my career, our restaurants here were all big and flashy and they were really more, they might be beautiful, but they maybe weren't necessarily that great. Mm -hmm. And there's been a, a change to lots of smaller owner operated places that are really doing phenomenal food. And I travel all over the world and eat all over the world. And I would put Atlanta up against major cities everywhere any day of the week. And that's, I, we travel all the time, obviously with this mm -hmm. job as well. And I feel the same exact way. I was wondering why it took them so long to get here. <laughs> um, how would you describe it to, you know, someone who hasn't been to Atlanta, the food scene here? What makes it special and unique here in Atlanta. Atlanta is very unique because obviously folks not from here think Southern City, that's what it's all about. But Atlanta's unique. Atlanta has this incredible amount of diversity that has influenced our, our culture from a food perspective, from a music perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that that showcases what we do. And so there are really beautiful restaurants that are representing food from all over the globe right next to places that are perhaps doing something that's a bit more regionalized. And I think that's what makes it special. You know, I can just feel kind of the energy and passion that, that you have talking about not just this city, but I, I think how the food in industry is growing in the city. But for you, how did you get into this industry? Like, what was your origin story? Well, it's kind of funny. Like, I grew up in a, in a big family. So, and when I say big, I mean that we ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner together, and there was about 30 of us oh my each God. day. And my <laughs> grandmother <laughs> cooked for everyone. Yeah. And, Bless uh, her heart. I know. And, and so, as a little kid, I misconstrued the fact that everyone li like did what they were told like when she gave like said hey do this I thought it was because she was cooking not because she was their mom and grandma and so in my mind I was like I like being the boss I should learn how to cook the two must go together right. and so it, it started that way to more than anything else really game changer restaurant in Mercedes-Benz Stadium what was that experience like and, and what does it mean to you to to have a piece of yourself in in something so big Mercedes-Benz Stadium yeah when Mr. Blank reached out and said that he wanted something of ours in there at first I was like what in the world are we gonna put there and then <laughs> we kind of came up with this idea that we felt like people should be able to get a really phenomenal meal regardless of where they are in the city and having an opportunity to showcase our food to folks not just Atlantans but people coming in to the right. games whether it be to see the Falcons or to see the United or maybe even a concert was a really special opportunity for us now the challenge was how do we feed in this case oftentimes six seven thousand people a day is what that restaurant will do and wow. that comes with its own challenges because <laughs> I come from the world of fine dining where we feed a hundred people a day right, right. so we had we actually literally called folks around the country who we thought did a great job and asked if they would help us and they did a lot of my peers stepped up and said here are best practices and we put them in place and lo and behold that was five years ago six years ago that we started that project wow. that's interesting what's the biggest thing you learned through that process or something maybe you didn't expect about feeding people at that size? <laughs> it's very assembly line it's everybody yeah. has a job and one, one job it's yeah. like you're the person who puts the chicken on the bun you don't put the mayonnaise on that's that guy right there don't touch the mayonnaise like it's very much like like that. Yeah. So it, in some ways to me it looks very inefficient, but in mm. reality it's hyper efficient. Mm. <laughs> For you, lifelong Falcons fan, 
Do you have a favorite memory or, or something that really stands out to you that, that you look back on and you're like, ah, oh, that's to me like the quintessential Falcons fan moment? I do, and it's one that won't mean anything to anyone else. But a few years ago, I had an opportunity to take my father, my uncle, and one of my cousins to a game. We were hosted by the Falcons. We had a chance to meet players like Ward Dunn, people who I'm like a huge fan of wow. from childhood. And it was great. We had phenomenal seats, and it was a really wonderful family experience for people who've been fans for forever. The, the significance of this is that my father and my uncle have since passed away. Mm -hmm. And so this photo pops up every year about this time in my memories. And it's it's something that's really special to me because that was an opportunity that weirdly, somehow, some way, even though my whole family have been fans for forever, we'd never really done it as a family. We hadn't mm -hmm. gotten that kind of group together and gone together as a family. That's, that's really special. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on this team, where they're at right now? I mean, I know that they yeah. <laughs> It's so... <laughs> Then maybe that says it all. <laughs> well, no, so very <laughs> candidly, it is like a roll the dice kind of thing. I feel like we are so close. Like it feels right. like we have so many incredibly talented people. No, it's not, it's not that we, that's not a question. I don't know, as I am no professional football coach, <laughs> what the missing piece of the puzzle is to get everyone to play to their potential because I know that we have more potential than we're showing on the field. And some days it sinks up and some days it doesn't. And that's really frustrating. Uh, and I'm sure it's infinitely more frustrating as a player, as a coach, than it is for us. <laughs> so I want to ask too, you were talking about you know, how you got into this, this cooking industry and becoming a chef, but how did you become a football fan? Like, What are some of your mm. early memories of football? So I grew up in a family that is very football centric so like playing football from childhood um, and being really really passionate about it I it's one of those that it sort of comes along with as I start to remember life as a child football goes alongside it I remember playing for my pop Warner team at five years <laughs> old but I was bigger than the five-year-old so I played on the <laughs> seven eight nine year old team as a nose tackle <laughs> when I was five um, but my uncle also coached the team and we were the Falcons as well because oh, he was a huge that. Falcons fan and so I've the red and black like whether it be the University of Georgia or the Falcons is all that I have ever been my my whole life and so um, it just I loved it too because as a kid who loved food when I was playing what came along with it is that I was allowed to eat dinner both at my house and at my friend's <laughs> house every night and there so two dinners a night that's that's how I shape this physique I have in front of you here. Keep that the nose tackle. Nose tackle yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome well thanks so much for sharing all those stories that's really fun. Um, anyone who wants to catch the full conversation, head to fox5atlanta.com. We'll post the whole thing on there, and we'll be right back on Rise Up Tonight. Hey, Atlanta, this is Head Crack talking, and you're watching Rise Up Tonight, presented by AT&T. It's like I don't get caught up in whatever narrative is after four weeks of the daily narratives. You can almost write some of these narratives and live and die every week by the narratives. I don't use that lingo. That's the sensational line. It's like the scene with the dudes chasing the guy down from Happy Gilmore. Run. Give away our scheme. What the hell is going on? Now you're really trying to put me on the hot seat here. Some narratives, narratives. <laughs> All right, you've heard of Cordero Patterson's angry runs. How about an angry hot take? We're so angry, we've dusted off our favorite hats, y'all. I am channeling my inner Sandra Bullock right now. Run the dang ball. We thought it would be this team's bread and butter in 2023. Instead, it has remained like a lot of things these Atlanta Falcons do wildly inconsistent. The Falcons have rushed for more than 150 yards in four games. They've only lost one of those. They average just 32 rushes per game, third in the NFL, but when they rush, more times in a game than that average they are five and one this season both those outlier losses the Arizona loss for what it's worth the Falcons backfield accounted for all three of their offensive scores in the 24 10 season opening win against the Panthers when the Falcons commit to the ground game things go well also rain in the forecast Sunday in Charlotte so run the dang ball all right all right, so I'm keeping the hat on to stand in solidarity with Kelly, but I'm also <laughs> dusting off an old hot take. We're bringing it to the front burner, y'all, not the back burner where it's been simmering. So, yeah, my hot take, someone besides Jesse Bates will cause a turnover. Ooh. We've seen Jesse Bates do it all. Peanut punch, jumping routes, a pick returned, 95 yards for a touchdown. It's time for someone else in the secondary to step up and make a splash play against a rookie quarterback. I like it. I like it. Desmond Ritter, 3-3 three and three in games that he starts on the road. We'll see you next week.